Dr Lovegrove is the head of solar thermal for IT Power, a UK based renewable energy consulting company. He has 28 years of experience in solar thermal energy, combined with 15 years of experience teaching undergraduate and postgraduate courses in energy systems and systems engineering. He was previously the leader of the Solar Thermal Group at the Australian National University. In that role, he was lead inventor and the design and construction team leader of the 500 square metre, the world's largest, Generation 2 Big Dish Solar Concentrator, recognised with several engineering awards. Welcome, Dr. Love Thanks very much, Liz and Gemma, and good evening, everyone. And um, thank you very much for inviting me here to, let's say, just tell you a little bit more about the technical background to solar thermal and the industry and where it's at and what the technology means and represents and hopefully the value that it can bring to a state like South Australia. So let me preface it by saying we are in the middle of an energy revolution and it comes as no surprise to people here in South Australia. You are the proud owners of the highest levels of renewable energy penetration in Australia and world leading in fact in terms of the wind and the PV that's here already. Concentrating solar is part of the energy revolution and I'm going to try and put that in context for you and why it will continue to be a part. But first of all, for those who are not completely familiar, in the top right there is the solar tower configuration that the Portacaster Repower people are so fond of and for good reason, uh, but it also comes in other forms too. The one on the top left, the trough concentrator idea, is the industry dominant form of concentrating solar power at the moment. 95% of the systems built use the trough concentrators, mainly because they have the longest track record. There's working systems that are now 30 years old in California, and this makes them lower risk and easier more realistic to finance. And it's important to recognise that we're talking about very high capital investments here, and it won't just happen on a whim. Things need to go in stages, they need to be proven, and then they can be financed by um, the private sector. Down on the bottom left, we have a linear Fresnel idea. In fact, that's an idea that originated in Australia and still has a story to tell, and on the bottom Right there is the dish system that Liz was just mentioning that we pioneered at ANU. So that's the technology, it's all about mirrors, it's all about focusing the sun's radiation to a place, getting a high temperature and hence thermal, solar thermal. We can make temperatures well over a thousand degrees with the point focus systems on the right there. The linear focus systems go to about 400, 500 degrees. Uh, that's the distinction. We certainly can make the temperatures and pressures of steam needed typically in steam turbine based power production. So the idea that we're in an energy revolution, um, typically, realistically, changes in technology of this scale take something like half a century to happen. Um, we could argue we're about halfway into this clean energy revolution. What does that actually mean? So I think you could put wind somewhere like that. It starts slowly, it has a period of exponential growth. Maybe that settles to linear growth. And there does come a point when it's reached its final potential in terms of whatever contribution that will be. Um, and what we see is that the photovoltaic solar solution is following hot in its footsteps, growing fast, and I'm here to tell you tonight a little bit about the Concentrating Solar Thermal. You often see the acronym CSP, Concentrating Solar Power, sometimes Concentrating Solar Thermal, CST, it's all the same thing. So three technologies that are part of this energy revolution that have actually gone in a different, different sequence, and there's historical reasons for why that is. So the data that bears that out in terms of actual 
uh, installed capacity on the ground today and how that's trapped historically looks something like this. What you see is uh, it's on a reduced scale, so we have something like 370 gigawatts of installed capacity of wind globally at the end of 2014. Contrast that with 177 of photovoltaics. And then you could say the Cinderella of concentrating solar is sitting there at four and a half gigawatts at the end of 2014. But if we look at the trajectories that they followed, they're very, very similar. And you can see that solar thermal today is more or less exactly where photovoltaics was just 10 years ago. Um, and 10 years ago, we would have been looking at photovoltaics and seeing that wind was way up there, but that was not a reason to give up on photovoltaics, far from it. Um, and way back in the 80s, well, an interesting thing for me with this time scale on here is that I began my teaching career at ANU in 1993, and at that time I loaded a bunch of students in a bus and we drove all the way from Canberra to the Bolivar Sewage Treatment Works in, in Sydney. Sorry, I'm getting my states mixed up. Whatever they, wherever they treat their sewage in Sydney anyway. Um, there was one solitary wind turbine. It was about 400 kilowatts and it didn't even work. And I drove my students all that way to see a wind turbine. And now we have a major industry in this country and that's basically just um, 20 years or so. So, um, where is it happening? We had uh, initial leadership from the USA way back in the 80s, uh, at the end of the oil crisis, um, nipped in the bud by the Reagan administration. Um, and then a long period of nothing much anywhere in the world. And then back in 2005, we had some very strong leadership from Spain, um, subsequently uh, stopped by the uh, austerity measures that have followed their experience of the GFC, and uh, we have to give them some sympathy for that. We find that the USA came back on and is, is a kind of off and on again place because if you follow their politics over there, it's very much state-based. You've got California taking very lead positions and states like Nevada also getting in there, and then other states not doing anything, and then a, a president who's quite keen on it, but a congress who's not, so it's, it's a very hard situation to predict. Um, but other countries are becoming increasingly significant, and who are those other countries? India, Morocco, South Africa, Chile, they figure quite prominently. Obviously countries with good solar resources. What is notable, and what I guess does distinguish Australia somewhat, is that they are high solar countries that also happen to have strongly growing electricity demand. And a, and a big part of our challenge in the policy space in Australia is that our demand's been falling and we actually have an excess of capacity. So it, the, the challenge for us is how do we grapple with closing things down? It's not about can we build new things, it's about can we close old things? Uh, unless our demand comes back on strongly, of course. So, the point about CSP and why this Cinderella technology will keep on growing, in my opinion and many other people's opinion, is that the solar thermal technologies have energy storage nailed. It, it is completely proven. It's now used in more than half the plants constructed. And the, the solution that is currently the commercial standard, but not necessarily the only way to do it, not necessarily the way that will continue indefinitely in the future, but the one that works for now is this molten salt based energy storage. So just to make two clarifications there, it's not table salt, it's actually a, a, mis a mixture of sodium and potassium nitrate type salts, it's actually molten fertiliser if you will, um, and it stays molten. The, the euphemistically labelled cold tank there will be at about 230 degrees C. The hot tank will be something like 380 degrees C if you've got a linear concentrator plant, or if you go to one of these tower concentrators, it can be up to close to 600 degrees C. And the energy is stored by taking the cold fluid, adding heat to it, putting it in the hot tank, 
and then that's available to run back through heat exchangers to generate superheated steam, do the power production, <coughs> indeed 24 hours a day if you want it, but more importantly to be dispatchable, and really it's more about peak demand and balancing the system. The, the concept of baseload is rather an old concept now and is not inherently needed. So, so this is a proven solution. Um, the higher temperature range, if you can take your salt up to the 600 degrees instead of the, the 380 degrees, you're putting more energy into the same kilogram of salt. It is literally the same stuff in literally the same tanks and literally the same heat exchangers. So you can see you get better bang for your buck if you go to higher temperatures. Um, there's a very interesting idea that you could put electric heaters in these tanks too. It's a, it's a bit of a diversion, but there is actually a way of storing electricity if you'd already built your solar thermal plant. Um, one of the intriguing things about solar thermal is we talk a lot about what is the cost of the energy. It's, it's the critical metric. The interesting thing is when you build a solar thermal plant, if you add storage, you actually increase the amount of energy that you produce over the year. It makes your energy cheaper, which is quite a, an, an interesting phenomenon that by adding storage, you've got more energy out and it's more economic. So this is a very strong point about it. What do these plants look like? Here's a typical Spanish plant. Um, how am I going for time? Good, yep. Um, I'd better move it through. Typical plant, these are almost run, rolled out as a cookie cutter approach now in Spain up until when they ended the feed-in tariff scheme over there. This plant here is a, is a historic milestone from the industry and it's the one that features on many of the posters that were up on the screen before. Um, it's been operating since October 2011. It's the first commercial plant in the world that uses the direct heating of this salt for its energy storage. And it's, you, you wouldn't say it's a baseload plant per se, but it's as close as you can get. If you want a baseload plant, you can have a baseload plant. It's got 15 hours of storage. It has, on occasions, run for 36 days straight, non-stop generation, 24 hours a day. Um, so that this one, which has now been running for four years, really establishes this technology as at a level of maturity that does not yet match the troughs that have been running for 30 years, but it elevates it considerably up to a level of confidence that it didn't have the day it was first opened. And this really changes the debate that we can have here, here now from where it was just four years ago. <clears throat> um, the trough people have been doing some big things. Here we have a 280 megawatt plant with six hours of storage in Arizona, and this is the big news, I guess, in that uh, this is, in a sense, well, there, well, I've lost track of the posters, but this is the biggest ever tower plant. It's literally making its first electrons in the next few days. It's, it's in its final stages of commissioning, 110 megawatts with 10 hours of molten salt energy storage, the biggest ever single tower system that there has been. And uh, as well as that, there's this project, which actually doesn't have energy storage, but it's been running since mid-2014, and it, it shows that the tower configuration is getting a bit more experience. And in Australia, we don't have a lot to show for ourselves, but we do have this project that's been going for quite a while, um, and there's some issues here in that the, the company behind this, Riva, which ironically are a French nuclear uh, operation uh, appear to be leaving the solar business. Um, so we certainly hope that this plant, which is the one and only plant in Australia, will get finished in the near future. Um, so, okay, life wasn't meant to be easy, as the previous Prime Minister said. Um, it's not that simple. CSP today, the cost of energy is maybe one and a half times large-scale photovoltaics. It's maybe two and a half times the cost of wind, but it is at the top of its cost curve. I mean, we've seen this incredible progress with photovoltaics that in just a decade or two, prices have 
come down amazingly. And the people, the solar people who've been advocating for decades said, that's what will happen. If you deploy this, it will get more cost effective. It has. CSP is at the top of its cost curve and it can also come down. But cost of energy is not a great metric because there are other values. And the point is, um, variable generation, and by that I mean photovoltaics and wind, you can do an awful lot with, but you can't do everything with it. You cannot fill your network up with nothing but variable generation. Something has to balance it. If you put enough, this is modelling of course, but if you put enough variable generation into a system, what you actually find is the, the net load, the, the load that the other non-variable things have to meet, ramps up and down so fast that literally a gas turbine can't cope with that anymore. What do you have to do then? You, you literally have to take, tell the variable generators to switch off to avoid these extreme ramp rates. So there is a limit. So how do we achieve dispatchable renewables? Well, wind or PV, proven technologies, quite cost effective. They have a certain cost of energy. If you add an electrical storage system, it's going to cost you energy. The, the efficiency is less than one, and it's going to cost you a great deal more investment, a very great deal more investment. So that finally, your now dispatchable energy, which you want, is an awful lot more expensive than the variable energy that you had. You contrast that to solar thermal, it comes as a package. You can't separate the storage out of it. The storage comes with the system. The system is cheaper if you have the storage built into it. The thermal storage increases the output and actually gives it about the same capital cost and gives cheaper cost of energy. So finally, this cost of energy is cheaper by a long shot than adding electrical storage to the PV or the wind. What we need to do is realise that we, we need some of that, but it's not a competition. Really, what we want to do is have a system with an optimum mix of all of these things, because we know that the wind is the cheapest we can get, we know that the PV complements it nicely, but we know that the solar thermal storage is a really good way of filling in the gaps, and the right percentages of those give you the least cost mix. Don't just believe me, the Australian energy market operator did a study at, at the request of the federal government in 2013 of what would be the least cost mix of 100% renewables in Australia, and the pie chart tells you what they came up with. Um, interesting there is that they've given quite a lot of the pie to geothermal, that hasn't progressed that well so far, so it could be the case that geothermal, which is essentially a baseload renewable, would actually, if it, if it doesn't quite step up to the mark, the solar thermal storage would actually grow to take some of that as well. But all together, you put it together and you get 100% renewables at least cost. Here's an interesting thing that um, might take a little bit of digestion. This is a study that the uh, University of Technology in Sydney did. There's the idea of, okay, you've got a solar thermal plant, you've got a certain number of hours of storage, in this case five hours. So how reliable is that? I mean, that's only five hours storage, it's not a year of storage. This is an analysis of the probability that you can expect that plant to be there when you most need it meaning and the peak load times. So one would be, meaning the darkest colour, means it's as good as a gas-fired turbine, in statistically speaking. That would be the ideal. Um, green is obviously quite poor, so don't bother building it in Melbourne. The interesting thing, as you can see, if you compare summer to winter, is that the northern, from Port Augusta northwards, has the greatest amount of dark colouring on that map of anywhere in the national electricity market. So what it means is you, you have the most reliable direct solar of any state in the system, while some areas of Queensland have more solar than South Australia does averaged over the year, you have it when it's most needed better than they do. 
So that's a very interesting observation. So what's the value proposition? So great, it's green electricity, no greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's some very interesting community and society benefits because fundamentally the reason that it's a bit more expensive is that you employ more local people. So that becomes a bit of an interesting quandary that we, we, we deplore the fact that it's too expensive, but basically it's too expensive because we're employing local people. That's actually a plus in some people's eyes. You can hybridise it with fossil fuels. I won't dwell on option and hedging value, but if you do it now, it gives you more options for the future fundamentally. If you've added the thermal storage, you can move your energy sales to high demand periods when it's more valuable. You, you need this stuff in the system because steam turbines with all their angular momentum and so forth and synchronous generation are what you need for frequency and voltage control and all the things that make a network actually work. And then you've got a very interesting issue of avoiding network upgrades when you've got constraints where a bit of energy storage at the end would allow you to actually service the system. It's a very complex thing, got to be a case by case basis, but if you put all these things together, what I'm trying to show in that table is in an estimated way that whatever you think green electricity is worth, then the whole value package for CSP with storage is worth between 50 and 150% more than what you think green electricity is worth to you as a community. So it costs 50% more, it brings 50 to 150% more value, some of which is recognised in the market, some of which is not at this point in time. Um, some of you may know that ITPAD did a study in 2012 for the Australian Solar Institute, and we looked at it and we found, for example, that 15 gigawatts of capacity be, could be installed before you'd need any major grid extensions. At that time, we were anticipating the solar flagships program was going to build some big plants. That never happened. In the meantime, what has happened? Global capacity has increased 2 to 300 percent in three years. Systems of storage now dominate. We've seen a 25% decrease in cost in just three years by technology advances. So we were predicting a cost falling trajectory like that. The reality actually today, when we look at what might be possible, um, it's on the optimistic side of our cost prediction. So that's actually pretty pleasing. Gemma is wanting me to stop, so I better stop. Um, and I draw your attention to the very last point on this, which is to say it's a very great shame that in this rather mean-spirited discussion about the wreck we've been having lately, that we've missed the chance to have an intelligent discussion about what are the sort of policy measures that would take us to large amounts of renewables. And I put it to you that we need the equivalent of a wreck or something like that where the tariff support you get is in proportion to the demand at the time you generate. That all, all megawatt hours are not equal. That we should be rewarding the megawatt hours at high demand times more than the megawatt hours at low demand times. And that's the kind of policy response that will bring the right mix into the system. Thank you very much. lucky to have one of the country's leading solar thermal experts with us tonight, all the way from Canberra.